All right, hello gang, how are you doing this evening? Um, I am doing just fine myself. Uh, today, uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to go over together the uh, age of Jackson, uh, election uh, and ending with the uh, presidential election of 1840, okay? So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and transition to um, uh, a PowerPoint right now, and let's see. Here we go. And let's go to view, present. All right. Well, all right. So let's go to the beginning and Want to make sure that as we are um, going through this PowerPoint, that we make sure that at home that we are taking notes. Um, and uh, when we do our notes check this week, you'll you will need to be able to produce these notes. So um, I, I will be available in the morning if you have any questions um, regarding any of the content covered on this PowerPoint. So again, what we're looking at is the age of Jackson, which. We like to title The Triumph of White Hood, Manhood Suffrage. And of course, by the end of the, the PowerPoint, you're gonna understand um, this presentation this evening, you're gonna understand the full meaning of that term. Okay, so we're looking at the years, American history from 1828 to 1840. Okay, so really this is the age of Andrew Jackson. Uh, Andrew Jackson very quickly um, uh, comes onto the scene in the War of 1812 as a war hero, uh, the, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. Um, um, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, uh, he was born in South Carolina, uh, and but, but nonetheless is a product of the West, um, um, spending most of his adult life in Tennessee. Um, he was a, yeah, a fr known as a very rough individual, um, a guy who was very hot-tempered, uh, a frontier brawler, as we might say. Uh, during the Revolution, as a young boy, he was actually held as a prisoner of war uh, by the British Army and developed a, a very strong hatred of the British um, as a result of that experience. Um, after the War of 1812, Jackson continued to make a name for himself um, through the American military by being a successful Indian fighter, as we know. Uh, Jackson's exploits in Florida um, and his war against the, the Floridian Indian tribes uh, will further elevate himself into uh, a herodom status. Um, and, and ultimately, um, his actions in Florida will help in the Adams Onus Treaty, in which Florida will be annexed from Spain. Um, of course, after uh, his time in the military, he will earn a law degree and, and eventually will serve in uh, governor of Tennessee. Uh, in Tennessee, he's, uh, he's very wealthy, uh, slave-owning um, planter, and the name of his um, estate, the Hermitage, the Hermitage. So the age of Jackson, uh, I think a, a, an important um, adjective to use to really describe this period, it was very volatile. It was a very volatile period, uh, turbulent period. Um, it was a period of both boom and bust cycles uh, economically. Uh, it's during the age of Jackson in which the United States is in a period of transition um, where where, where we see great population shifts out of the east and towards the west. Uh, we will see um, the uh, further industrialization of the United States um, during the period. 
institutionalized violence, racial antagonism, utopian communities, the rise of reform movements, and of course, uh, one of the great developments of the period would be the abolitionist crusade and the quote unquote great Southern reaction to the abolitionists uh, as, they, as the planters in the South seek to um, defend slavery. So, uh, so it is, you know, following the era of good feelings, this period of unity and, and nationalism, the age of Jackson is one of sectionalism and division, a great party ranker, ranker amongst the parties. Um, because uh, of the corrupt bargain election of 1824, Jackson will have initiated uh, the two party system um, in American politics in the in the 1828 election. The age of big picture here. What was the age of Jackson? It was also a time period of graft and corruption, of machine politics and ruthless political bosses. So uh, graft, graft is defined as using one's political position in order to make oneself powerful, rich. Um, to use a, a, a government position to make one rich. Uh, it was a period in which uh, the U.S. government, really government at, at, at all levels, uh, becomes highly corrupt. Um, and uh, in which politics will be run by uh, political organizations, run by really shady political bosses that uh, wield their power and influence for their own personal gain. But above all, the age of Jackson, it was the age of the self-made man. Um, it, was, it was a time in which uh, we see elitist rule give way to what we call popular democracy. Popular democracy is this idea that more and more Americans are going to gain the right to vote, at least for white males. And so at the, the very beginning, we look at this, this unit as this, the triumph of white manhood suffrage. And so it's during the age of Jackson in which we are going to see the development of popular democracy, in which more and more whites, white males, are going to gain the right to vote. So between 1820 and 1840, America will witness the rise of universal manhood suffrage. Uh, we will have longer ballots, um, meaning that more uh, offices, political positions will will emerge, will be created. Um, candidates will be selected uh, via nominating conventions rather than by party um, leaders. And we're going to see more grassroots political parties where, where really political parties that originate at the grassroots level, at the uh, at the bottom of society. Um, so Jackson, of course, uh, we, we see him as the first common man president. Ideas and, and ideology are really going to strike a chord with ordinary Americans. And so uh, he had an indelible faith in the common man, uh, which really, uh, in describing it, he had an intense distrust of the elite establishment in the East, uh, of monopolies, special privilege. In many ways, he's very much Jeffersonian in the idea that he opposed any conglomeration of power. And he thought that that's exactly what had happened. By the late 1820s, he's of mind that government has grown too large, too powerful, and elitist interests have really hurt common interests, interests of the common man. His his heart and soul was with the plain folk. And so though he himself was very elitist, his message was geared towards ordinary Americans. And he held the belief that common men, despite their education level and their status, were capable of uncommon achievements. Much like the election of 1800, the election of 1828 was also a revolution in many ways. Uh, for the first time, citizens, U.S. citizens, no longer looked to their betters for leadership, as they did in the world of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson believed that the government should be run by the talented, the educated, the literate, and uh, 
Jackson, um, during his era, citizens no longer are going to look towards the Jeffersons in order to govern. From now on, it is going to be fatal to even be labeled an aristocrat or an elitist. Um, and so uh, the revolution of 1828 is called the revolution in large part due to uh, the voice of common men through the triumph of white manhood suffrage. Okay. Uh, power is going to shift into the hands of common men. If you look down here, um, you're going to find that um, the election of 28 was a triumph. It was a winner. The, the winners were laborers, workers, artisans, small farmers, small merchants over the big bosses, uh, over big wealth and the rising in industrial and commercial interests. And so uh, in the election, we do see uh, a power shift from the east to the west and and to go back and look at you know the idea that that citizens no longer look for their betters for leadership jackson had a political slogan uh, of adams can write jackson can fight and so jackson acknowledged that he wasn't the brainiac that adams was but he made up for it in his ability to fight on behalf of common interests Politicians were the men who had special appeal to the masses, who became the vocal advocate of the people's right to rule. Because the election of 1828, now from here on out, in order to be elected into any office of any level of government, you had to appeal to the masses. You just could not appeal to one singular group of people like the elites. Okay, so um, the election of 1828 was a very nasty election. Like 1800, um, it was it was one filled with a lot of mudslinging uh, between uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, the son of John and Abigail Adams, and um, and of course the Democrat uh, Andrew Jackson. Of course, one of the uh, charges leveled at Jackson by the Adams campaign was that. Um, prior to being married, Rachel here, Jackson's wife, um, Jackson's wife had, had uh, was married to another man, and that Jackson, uh, Andrew, and Rachel had begun their love affair um, before the divorce to her first husband was final, and so they were living. Um, they were essentially. Uh, engaged in adultery um, and and Rachel during the election will grow ill um, obviously I think historians argue that you know he uh, this news really complicated her health problems she had health issues and she eventually dies she dies during the election and uh, Jackson will enter the White House a widow uh, here you can see Jackson mourning for his wife he also um, holds his political enemies uh, to blame for the death of his wife. So he enters the White House alone, and he enters the White House bitter. So as I mentioned before, this is the era of, of white manhood suffrage, in large part because you can see that from 1800 to 1830 that the property, you know, voting was based on property, those who own land. All right, and so gradually what you find is that over time that the land owning requirements uh, for voting were being replaced more with taxpayer qualifications. If you are a taxpayer, then you are now a legal voter. And so you can see obviously another move from 1800 to 1830 is this movement towards no qualifications at all. Uh, in places like Missouri and Kentucky and South Carolina, and these northern states, that the, the move in democracy is to eliminate barriers for voting for white males. And the, no one benefited more from this than Andrew Jackson. Uh, you could also see that from 1824 to 1860, which is the obviously the election of, uh, of uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, down here, is that the, the number, the voter turnout is going to skyrocket look from 1824 to 1828 you can see 
that the growth of the American electorate, the number of Americans voting are going up and is a large part due to the elimination of these voting barriers. Okay, so this is a very important development in democracy. Uh, and we refer to this development as Jacksonian democracy. Okay, it's called Jacksonian democracy. Uh, Jeffersonian democracy um, is this idea that it should be government for the people. Jacksonian democracy is the belief that government should be done by the people, by the people. And so as, as you can also see a, a, a shift going on uh, by 1828 in which really benefits the Democrats and benefits Jackson is the fact that the population center is gradually moving west. And so as the, as the population gradually moves, the center of the, of the population moves to the west, that no longer that, that benefits that, that that's a shift of power, political power to the West. So this is an era in which the East is losing power and yet the Western states are, are gaining power. And you can see here in the election of 1828 that uh, John Quincy Adams' base of support is largely in New England, whereas Andrew Jackson has this appeal uh, in both the South and the West. Um, so unlike 1824, this election turns out well for Jackson. Uh, Adams finds himself on the losing end, and we will not we will not have an election go to the House. Okay, so as inaugurations, basically the way the campaign went is that uh, during the election campaign, Jackson remained very vague on issues. They would ask uh, people would ask Jackson his opinion on the tariff, or his opinion on the bank, or his opinion on internal improvements he was very vague on his answers he would never really come out and and definitively uh articulate what he was for or what or, or what he was against and what he ran on was essentially his 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 status as a war hero as a national figure and the meat grinder issues that often are very uh unpopular are very contentious he chose to be very vague on those issues. Obviously, in his inaugural address, he will address each of these individually. Um, he favored retirement of the national debt, um, he, a return uh, to a greater sense of respect for states' rights, a just policy towards the Indians, a policy that we will um, really come to know and, and understand uh, during our debate. Um, he promoted the idea of rotation in office, which we'll get to here in a minute. Um, but, but ultimately, in, in as president of the United States, uh, during his inaugural address, he was even vague as to what he was going to do regarding these uh, very important sectional issues. Okay, so ultimately, what we did know is that by electing Jackson, it did usher in this era of the common man and his inaugural ball. Um, uh, the inaugural ball was a very rough affair. Uh, there were furniture that was thrown out into the front lawn. Here you can see uh, just a grand old party. Um, you got commoners there drinking their hard cider, um, getting in fist fights, and and the elites had to be thinking that oh my goodness, we just turned the keys to sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue over to. NASCAR America. So, Jackson created a new political force. By appealing to the people at the bottom, he created a new coalition of voters. This is your new Democrat coalition, um, the Democratic Party, which included, obviously, the planetary elites in the South, the people on the frontier, politicians to a national system, and, of course, a big appeal that that the Democrats will have, and a big source of their power for the years to come will be the immigrants who are largely beginning to flood into the United States and through northern ports. So after the inaugural, one thing that you need to understand is that uh, usually after every inaugural address, the, the president's first job is to appoint people into government positions. 
And so the Washington, D.C. was filled with thousands of people who had come to Washington, D.C. in order to seek a government job. And so um, the whole idea that Jackson ran on, he's, he believed that um, uh, well, before the election, he said that he was going to turn the rascals out and let the people rule, meaning he was going to see... Um, he was going to get rid of the John Quincy Adams Republicans and replace the Adams people with his people. Okay, in which what we, that's what we call rotation in office. Rotation in office, he believed, was supported by democratic principles. He said that democratic principles supported the idea that when that a man should serve a term in government, then return to the status of private citizen. For the office holders who stayed too long became corrupted by a sense of power. So the idea is that the longer one is in government, the more likely he is to become corrupt. And that really, in a healthy democracy, a public servant should serve just a brief period of time and then go back, go back home and let someone else have a turn. And so that's called rotation of office. And he argued, quote, is promoted by party appointments by newly elected officials. So when one president leaves office, so should all of his people. And so every four years or every time we inaugurate a president, the out the, the old people leave and the new president brings in his people. So this, of course, becomes known as the spoils system. Democrat Senator William L. Marcy quoted in 1832, to the victor belong the spoils. And um, even though Jackson believed in the spoils system, the idea that whoever the winner of an election is gets to bring his people um, with him to uh, office and, and, and work for him. I know that uh, under this principle, if, if I was to become president of the United States, I no doubt would bring to Washington people that were loyal to me people that were loyal to me, people that had my back, people that I could trust. And so Jackson believed that this was critical in the spoil system. But despite the fact that he um, supported the idea of the spoil system, he only replaced about 9% of appointed officials in the federal government. And during his entire time as president, he only replaced 20% of the office holders. So, but no doubt the spoil system is here to stay. And, and with the spoil system, what the problem is, is that you're bringing people, uh, you're filling jobs in Washington with people who aren't as talented, um, who aren't as educated. And, and that's where, that's where the corruption comes in. And, um, the victor, the, the, uh, the spoil system did result and a great deal of corruption, uh, not only on the national level, but you know, on all levels of government, on the state and local level as well. Um, now, when once Jackson became president, he he had basically two cabinets. He had his formal cabinet, okay, and then he relied uh, mostly on the advice of his kitchen cabinet, um, which. They call it the kitchen cabinet because he was said to have met, uh, this cabinet was set to have met in the kitchen of the White House. Um, but the kitchen cabinet was a very powerful, influential group. Um, you know, the, the whole idea is that the, the formal cabinet, uh, the cabinet that includes all the, you know, Secretary of State and Secretary of War and the Treasury Secretary, um, the formal cabinet is approved by Congress. Congress has oversight over that cabinet. The kitchen cabinet operated separately and outside the uh, accountability of the Congress. And so the kitchen cabinet included um, uh, Martin Van Buren, his secretary of state. He was the only one of, uh, that was in his official cabinet, his formal cabinet, to action cabinet. Um, but uh, in his kitchen cabinet were, of course, Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren of New York, a, a former senator of New York, um, guy he appointed as Secretary of State. 
um, Jackson was was really really tight with Martin Van Buren. They were they were very they worked very very closely with each other. Um, you know, Jackson is entering the presidency. He doesn't have a whole lot of political experience. Doesn't really understand how Washington works. So he 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 surrounds himself with Martin Van Buren and kitchen cabinet also included um, other party leaders in the in the in the in the uh, in the D, in the DC. Uh, uh, in D.C., journalists, uh, newspaper editors, uh, amongst others, and uh, so the Jackson was highly criticized for relying on the advice of the kitchen cabinet and and kind of neglecting his formal cabinet. Now you could really define the the Jackson presidency by uh, a number of rivalries that he's going to develop. Um, he, he's going to have a, he's a man of many enemies. And, and so the first one obviously is, is going to be the, the one his the falling out that he has with John C. Calhoun. So there was a big rivalry within his president, within his, within the West wing of the white house between Martin Van Buren, who of course, as I mentioned before, is his secretary of state and John C. Calhoun, uh, the, the, the Southern statesman from South Carolina, he is vice president of the United States. And so much of the political history of the next few years would really turn upon this internal rivalry between these two men as each man jockeyed for position as the heir apparent to Andrew Jackson. And it became very clear to uh, John C. Calhoun that Martin Van Buren was indeed that man. Uh, John C. Calhoun, of course, is a guy, he's a lot like Henry Clay really wants to be president of the United States, and he's gonna ride Andrew Jackson's coattails. He's gonna really try to buddy-buddy up with Jackson in hopes that Jackson will select him as his heir um, to succeed him as president. But ultimately, Jackson will not side with Calhoun and, and, and align himself more with Martin Van Buren. What really helps cause a falling out, you need to know this, uh, what, what really results in the falling out um, between Calhoun and Mark and Calhoun and, and Jackson, uh, really, it, it comes down to the fact that Calhoun comes to the conclusion that Van, Van Buren is his favorite. Um, now, another event that takes place that really uh, puts a lot of distance um, between uh, Jackson and Calhoun, his vice president, the Peggy Eaton affair. Peggy Eaton is the uh, cabinet secretary he's the wife she's the wife of cabinet secretary thomas eaton thomas eaton is the treasury secretary peggy eaton is a lady of ill repute uh, in other words she is a a former lady of the night she is a former prostitute and uh who thomas eaton marries and floride calhoun who's the vice president's wife would consistently snub Miss Eaton um, at events. You know, they would have their events, their parties, their balls, their galas. And whenever the the, the wives of the cabinet would, would get together, Floride Calhoun, at the end of the day, was a huge bully. She would bully Miss Eaton, exclude her from things, talk trash behind her back, and, and snubbed her at every turn. And Jackson felt sorry for it. Jackson, um, Peggy's plight re reminded Jackson of the gossip that had pursued Rachel, his dead wife. Quickly, Jackson pronounced Peggy as uh, chaste, as a virgin, that, he, that she is pure. And to a friend, he wrote, I did not come here to make a cabinet for the ladies of this place, but for the nation. So he's very bitter that this is even an issue. Um, so despite, despite all this, uh, his cabinet officers and verbally uh, reprimanded each one of them for the behavior of their wives. And... Um, And of course, in that cabinet meeting, Jackson really let Calhoun's habit 
And he told, essentially, he told John C. Calhoun to control his wife. And so this further alienated Calhoun from Jackson and, and caused uh, an even greater divide between the two men. Um, and so here you can see, you know, uh, this is a, a famous cartoon, a uh, political cartoon, where you have Jackson, he's in his, uh, uh, his chair, it's, the chair is collapsing. He is, he is surrounded with nothing but consternation in his cabinet room. It's like his administration is always in disarray. He's a lot of the, the cabinet officers, as you see down here, that are rats, um, are are corrupt. And and a lot of his cabinet officers, because um, you know, some of these cabinet officers were very upset and angry at the kitchen cabinet. The fact that Jackson really didn't consult uh, his cabinet officers with advice. Um, so you see back here on the wall, you see letters of resignation, you know, letters of resignation and, uh, and, uh, they're, they're fleeing, they're fleeing the cabinet. Uh, they're scurrying like rats. And here you can see, here's, uh, Martin Van Buren, who Jackson's trying to restrain by stepping on his tail. Um, so, but many of these cabinet appointments were forced to resign in disgrace. So he, he's got a lot of issues in his cabinet. So, well, Capital Society weathered the chilly winter of 1829 to 18, 1830. Van Buren prepared some additional blows to Calhoun. Uh, he brought Jackson into the opposition of internal improvements at the behest of John C. Calhoun. And so um, Jackson, of course, uh, the issue of internal improvements um, did not oppose them. He just opposed internal improvements at federal expense, with the exception of interstate projects like the National Road, um, as well as road building in the territories, river and harbor bills, and other pork barrel projects. Um, he, was, he was very much supportive of those. He, 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 he did seek to try to limit uh, state projects at federal expense. One example um, uh, of, a, of a partisan issue regarding the internal improvements deals with the Maysville Road veto in 1830, a road which connects Cincinnati, Ohio to Maysville, Kentucky. Maysville, Kentucky just happens to be uh, the home region of Speaker of the House Henry Clay. So no doubt Clay would benefit greatly from this uh, piece of legislation. And so, but at the time, uh, Jackson and Clay had a great uh, feud going, so he vetoes it. Um, he vetoes the bill, uh, not because um, he didn't support it. He vetoed it because he did not like, because it's because of his personal feud that he had with Henry Clay. So uh, another issue, and of course this issue is going to do a great deal of harm and really is going to deal the, the final deadly blow to the Jackson Calhoun uh, relationship is the issue of nullification. So it says here, there's a fine irony to Calhoun's plight in the Jackson administration. For Calhoun was now in mid passage from his early phase as a war hawk nationalist to his later phase as a states' rights sectionalist and open to the th and, and open to thrust on both flanks. So in other words, Calhoun begins his political career as one of those nationalist war hawks, but by but the older he gets, um, he becomes more and more of a, a, a states' rights uh, sectionalist. John uh, C. Calhoun, obviously the seventh president of the United States, leading Southern politician, South Carolina. Uh, he's a brilliant orator and writer, began his political career as a nationalist, as I mentioned before, a proponent of protective tariffs. And of course, he would much later on become a proponent of uh, lower tariffs, uh, nullification, limited government, and states' rights. So he's going to be a major statesman for the next few years to come here. So ultimately, what's going to help push Calhoun out of the vice presidency and have him return home to his home state of South Carolina has a lot to do with what was going on in South Carolina. Conditions in his home state of South Carolina um, were, were deteriorating um, in the 1820s. South Carolina had, had experienced a prolonged agricultural depression, um, because of which 
70,000 South Carolinians are going to flee uh, and leave the state. And uh, twice as many will leave the state during the 1830s. And so what happens is as a state gets smaller in terms of population, then it loses power. It loses congressmen. It loses electoral votes. And so the power of South Carolina uh, is shriveling. It is shrinking. And, and what happens when the economy is bad, when things aren't going well, Americans will play the blame game. And so blame will be levied on the protective tariff, which tended to raise the price of manufactured goods and reduce the ability of British and French traders to acquire the American money of bills and bills of exchange with which to buy cotton. And so the belief was that the tariff worsened the problems of low crop prices, cotton prices, and the problem of exhausted land. They just didn't have, they needed more land. So, um, the tariff. The tariff becomes a big issue. Also, what's going on in the state is abolitionism. Abolitionism is growing during the early 1830s, uh, late 1820s, early 1830s. And so South Carolina, really, which has the greatest dependence on slavery uh, than any state in the Union, um, begins to become more defensive. So as the um, as abolitionism grows, the, the negative reaction grows with it, okay? The, the South Carolinians find themselves more defensive. Uh, and of course, in 1822, we have uh, a mulatto slave, uh, a mulatto, not, not a slave, a, a freedman, a uh, mulatto freedman in, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, organizes and uh, carries out uh, what would have been one of the largest slave revolts um, in American history at that time. Uh, unfortunately for Denmark Vesey, uh, the, uh, the slave revolt was quelled. Uh, Vesey and his supporters were hanged. And so this did uh, a great deal of damage in, in really making South Carolinians even more anxious um, and over, over political issues. So. Uh, over the political condition and the economic condition of the state. Um, so, the Tariff of Abominations in 1828. Uh, the Tariff of Abominations uh, were um, signed into law prior to Jackson becoming president. It was done by Adams on his way out. It was the highest tariff in American history. Um, at that time, it was a, a tariff that uh, increased uh, tariff rates to an all-time high of 45%. And so um, Calhoun had no choice uh, but to oppose the Jackson administration and uh, in its support of the, of the tariff, uh, joined the opposition in his state against uh, the tariff. And so he wrote a document, you need to know this, called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. And the reason why he writes this is because um, many in his home state began to ar ar argue that um, what South Carolina needed to do was to secede from the Union, okay, secession. They began to talk about secession. And so uh, he wrote this in opposition to the tariff, but really what he wanted to do is he wanted to check the power of the most extreme states' rights advocates with uh, the theory of nullification, rather than endorse secession, he, you know, he, for what it's worth, Calhoun, he's still a union man, and he and he hates secession. Um, so rather than debate secession, he said that instead of seceding from the union, the state of South Carolina should just simply nullify it. Uh, nullification, of course, is an issue that was first raised in the Virginia Kentucky Resolutions. Uh, following the passage of the Alien Sedition Acts. And so, uh, so this is not new. This is not new. His object was serve the Union by protecting minority rights, in which he believed that the agricultural and slaveholding South claimed. Uh, what's going on at this time, if you think context, is that the United States is going through a lot of change. It's becoming more industrial, and the population... Um, is growing at a very, 
very fast rate, especially in the north. And as the population grows and as industrialization takes off, the agricultural south is finding itself as more and more, becomes more and more of a minority. They see themselves as a minority, they feel like a minority, and they feel like they're losing power. So they promote nullification in order to protect the rights of their of their agricultural slave owning state uh, in the face of um, power loss. Uh, now, Jackson was destined to draw the line at any defiance of federal law. So Jackson was going to uphold the law and he was supportive of the tariff. So basically one of two outcomes were good or would be possible. Either, you know, in, in relation to the tariff for abominations, either A, the federal government would have to abandon the law and repeal it, or B, it would have to get a constitutional amendment re removing all doubt to as to its validity. Um, but the immediate issue was the constitutionality of the tariff. The belief is uh, that Calhoun promoted was that uh, the, the tariff benefited one section of the country at the expense of another section, making it unconstitutional. Let me say that again, that the tariff benefited one section of the country the industrial north at the expense of another section of the country, the agricultural south, and that any law that benefits one group over another at the expense of another is unconstitutional. The South Carolinians argued that the Constitution only authorized tariffs for revenue purposes and not for protective tariffs, not, not in order to protect uh, American industries. So. South Carolina delayed any action against the tariff with hopes that John C. Calhoun would be elected Vice President of the United States. The state anticipated a new tariff from the administration. Obviously, it's not going to happen. Um, but before this, uh, the Webster-Haney debate takes place uh, on the floor of the Senate uh, between Robert Haney of South Carolina, who's trying to align Southern senators with Western senators. Um, basically saying, hey, listen, Western senators, if we will support you in lowering the value of land out West and trying to reduce the, the price of land in the West in exchange, Western senators, I would like your help in lowering tariffs. So what, what Haney's trying to do, Haney, Haney is trying to build an alliance with Western senators to where the Southern senators are going to help the lower land prices in the West and Western senators are going to help the South get tariffs lowered. And so uh, he makes the argument that the government endangers the union when it passes any policy that imposes a hardship upon one section to the benefit of the other, okay? So on the other side, you got Senator Daniel Webster um, of New Hampshire. He arose to defend the Northeast. Webster, of course, was successful in the, in the debates. He prevented Haney from forging an alliance with the West by forcing Haney to defend states' rights and the doctrine of nullification. And rather than ducking the issue, Haney took the bait, and they had a famous debate on the Florida Senate in which they debated, essentially, what is the true meaning of the Constitution? Haney began to defend the South Carolina Exposition, the document that Calhoun wrote. By the way, when Calhoun wrote the South Carolina Exposition in protest, he did not put his name on it because he was running for president, excuse me, he was running for vice president at the time. So... Um, Haney uh, defended uh, the South Carolina Exposition, appealed to the example of the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions that had been written 30 years before, and, and, and called to attention the Hartford Convention. So he, you know, he really kind of rubbed the nose, uh, the, the North's nose, and the fact that it was the Federalist that actually brought up the secession word that... Uh, uh, acted uh, in out of self-interest uh, first through the Hartford Convention. He argued that the union was created by a compact of the states, and that the federal government could not be the final judge of its own powers. 
In other words, the powers of the federal government can be limited and that the states have rights to defend themselves from a large national government. The states remain free to judge the, constitutionally of, uh, the constitutionality of laws when it oversteps its constitutional authority. So when the national government oversteps its constitutional authority, he argued that because the constitution was written by the states, that the states could limit the laws when they overstep the bounds of constitutional authority. Webster, in his rebuttal, okay? So again, Haney makes the argument that what happened in Philadelphia in 1787 is that the Constitution was created by the states, that the states joined the Union, created the Union, and each state joined voluntarily. And if they can voluntarily join, then they can voluntarily leave. And of course, so this is going to be a, an upcoming issue as we begin to examine to what extent is secession constitutional. And in Haynes, in his point of view, secession, nullification, and other states' rights are legal because it was the states that created the union, not the people. Now, Webster, his rebuttal, he had more of a nationalistic view of the Constitution. He said that the American Revolution was a crusade of a united colonies, that the, the, that the, the, the Union was not created in 1787. The Union was created during the Revolution. The Revolution was not fought by in, individual colonies by themselves. We had a continental army. It was a united event. So the union was created during the revolution, not in 1787 by the states. He also argued that true sovereignty in the constitution, true sovereignty resides in the people as a whole. The federal and state governments acted as their agents. So sovereignty resides in the people. And he believes this because he believes, he, he promotes the idea that the Constitution in Philadelphia was created in Philadelphia in 1787 by the people of the United States. Not by the states, but by the people. And that's, therefore, that's where the sovereignty resides. That's who has the final say. He said if a single state can nullify a law passed by Congress, then the union would be what he called a rope of sand, an absurdity. The Constitution created the Supreme Court with the final authority and jurisdiction on all questions of constitutionality. That power is not given to the states through nullification. A state can either nullify a law or secede from the union Because when the Constitution was created, it was created by the people, and therefore, only the people can destroy it, not the states. The Union is indestructible. No one state can destroy the Union through nullification or, or really through secession. So really, Webster wins the day. You know, uh, great, great passage from his speech. You know, Webster, one of the things we need to understand is that Webster is a, a very important statesman, very articulate. Some of, the, some of the greatest speeches about the sanctity of our union and of our country and our national government are gonna be delivered on the floor of the Senate by Mr. Webster. He says, when my, there's a very important passage of his speech here. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it aloud because it's gonna be very important later on to the story. He said, quote, when my eyes shall be turned to behold for the last time, the sun in heaven, may I not see him shining on the broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union. Let their last feeble and lingering glance, rather glorious ensign of the Republic, blazing on all its ample folds as they float over the sea 
and over the land. Liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. There was a time in which school children, as part of their assignment in their civics class or their social studies class, this is especially after the Civil War, where young American school children would memorize this passage. It's, it's one of the most elegant statements of extolling the importance of union and nationalism from any American statesman. Daniel Webster is that guy. This speech right here is why thousands and thousands of young men donned the blue uniforms and marched into the South and gave their lives during the Civil War. They were fighting to save the Union. Webster's Union, his concept of Union. So this is a very important moment. So obviously, Union and majority rule meant more to Westerners than state sovereignty and nullification. The fact is, the West wasn't going to join up with Haney because they didn't believe in nullification. They didn't believe in, in state sovereignty. And so Webster won the debate. Now, what about Jackson? Where does he side? Does he side with Haney? I mean, after all, Jackson is born and raised in South Carolina. Or does he side with Webster on this issue? Where does Jackson stand on nullification? During the uh, election, he didn't even talk about the tariff of uh, the tariff of abominations. He he wasn't outspoken on the issue. No one really knew where Jackson stood. And it's a debate. Jackson, like Calhoun, he was a slaveholder. He was, you know, he was a Westerner, but he owned slaves. He he came from the South. So does Jackson sympathize with his native state of South Carolina? Or as a nationalist hero, Battle of New Orleans, is he a Union man? Is he a Webster guy? Well, this is where we find out. It's called the Jefferson Day Dinner. Uh, it's a dinner that they held in Washington, D.C. every year to commemorate Thomas Jefferson's birthday. Usually at the Jefferson Day Dinner, it's a who's who of Washington society. Congressmen, judges, federal office holders of all levels, members of the executive branch, congressmen would gather for this event. And the Jefferson Day dinner would oftentimes result at the very end, at the very end of the dinner, they would go around the room and they would give toasts. You know, so you, you they would go around the room and give toasts, and usually at the very end, the President of the United States would give one of the final toasts. And so what they were going to do, um, the supporters of nullification, were going to go around the room, and they were going to give toasts, extolling the virtues of nullification and states' rights. And the whole time, they were going to watch President Jackson and see if he find out to what extent is he supportive of the toasts. And so as as they go, you know, they're they go around the room and so a guy from say North Carolina, a congressman from North Carolina would stand up and go, here's a toast to the the great Thomas Jefferson, a man who in this day would support nullifying such a tyrannical and egregious tariff like the one passed by John Quincy Adams. And then, of course, all of the supporters of this congressman would then raise their glass and drink, and those who didn't support the toast would just keep their glass down. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't toast at all, you know? And so the whole time, and they're going around the room and they're giving toasts, these Southerners, these Southern 
uh, congressmen, these senators, and these statesmen are going around the room and they're giving their toasts. Jackson isn't drinking. And so um, by the end of the evening, Jackson raises his glass and in his toast, he raises his glass, he looks across the room, he looks at John C. Calhoun and he says, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. One and inseparable. And so, um, so he quoted a speech from Daniel Webster. And according, according to records, Calhoun was trembling in anger, trembling. And uh, Calhoun then raised his glass and said, Liberty, next to our union, most dear. And so he basically, what we had as a result of the Jefferson Day dinner is that because of this rift, okay, um, it, it, it pretty much finalized, it, it finalized uh, a falling out between Jackson and Calhoun. Jackson is not going to support Calhoun in South Carolina in its efforts to nullify the tariff, which they believe is harming the economy of, of the state. Okay, so Calhoun's vote against Van Buren, against for being minister to London, pretty much the last straw. Calhoun realizes that he's not the heir apparent to succeed Andrew Jackson, that it's Van Buren. So Calhoun resigns as vice president, returns home to, the, to South Carolina, where he becomes a fierce states' rights nullificationist. And, you know, one thing about Calhoun, and you've got to give him props here, that Calhoun was a big supporter of, uh, he, he's, a, he's a political theorist. He, he's, he's, he's as important as Madison, um, that when we think of Calhoun, we think of a guy who's really interested in pro protecting minority rights. And the whole concurrent majority plan was a, a plan uh, promoted by Calhoun that, if enacted, would protect um, the agricultural South from a rising industrial North, um, protecting the rights of the minority. So when you think of Calhoun, think of a guy who's really into minority rights, protect the rights of the minority. So. So what happens, uh, 1832, uh, Jackson, of course, Jackson's not a nullifier. He doesn't believe in nullification. He, he, he goes to Congress and he tells the Congress, hey, listen, this, this tariff of abominations, this 45% tariff is just way too high. It's way too high. We got to lower it. So in 1832, Congress lowers the tariff from 45% to 35%, okay? And despite the fact that it's being lowered, South Carolina still considers the tariff protective, too high, not for revenue purpose. So South Carolina then took the drastic action by nullifying the tariff, and then they began to organize their military. In the crisis, South Carolina found themselves standing alone. And despite the sympathy expressed elsewhere, the Georgia legislature called for a Southern convention, but dismissed nullification. They called it rash and revolutionary. Alabama, they denounced nullification as unsound in theory and dangerous in practice. And Mississippi stood firmly resolved to put down nullification. So in other words, unlike 1860, when we actually have, you know, the secession of South Carolina, you know, in 1860, the rest of the southern states followed South Carolina's lead. They don't here. Okay, South Carolina finds himself by themselves. In fact, Jackson is firm intention to enforce the tariff. And he continues to plead with Congress 
to lower the tariff. But what he does say, he says we absolutely, what we, ha we, what we absolutely have to do is we have to have rule of law. Um, Jackson sends General Winfield Scott to Charleston Harbor with reinforcements of federal soldiers, and he is going to use military force in order to enforce the tariff in South Carolina. The nullifiers mobilize the state militia, while unionists in the northern states organized a volunteer force. So we are essentially, by 1832, we are on the verge of a civil war, not over slavery, but over the tariff. A compromise. Henry Clay steps in, author he authors the Compromise of 1833, which is the Tariff Bill of 1833. So in other words, what happens in the Tariff Bill is that we're going to see the tariff reduced from 35% and over a 10-year period. Okay. In exchange, Congress passes the Force Bill in which give, the Congress gives authority to the President of the United States to use military force to compel compliance with federal law. This is a way right here, this is a way right here, this is a way for Jackson to save face. So, okay, I'll come back to that. All right, so next we have uh, Jackson's Indian policy. I know his Indian policy we will uh, address in our um, uh, in-class debate. Um, we make sure we understand both uh, arguments for and arguments against. Um, ultimately, uh, by 1830, most Indians living in the East had already left their lands. Um, had already left their lands. But the remaining tribes you see here in the orange, Okay, are going to be subjected to the Indian Removal Act. See, so ultimately, what, what happens after the era of good feelings is that we have manifest destiny. We've got Americans desiring to live beyond the Appalachian Mountains in, the, in these Western territories, right? So there were two barriers, uh, two barriers that existed. Um, one, of course, would be uh, the, the lack of roads and bridges, canals, connecting the east to the west. And so that's where internal improvements come in. Internal improvements were supported for that reason, for those who supported Manifest Destiny, okay? And uh, the second would be, the second obstacle would be the Indians, uh, getting the Indians out of the way. The Indians were seen as an obstacle. They were seen as a barrier. Will you hold on a second, please? Thank you. Come on. Okay, I'm back. So, so Jackson, of course, you got to think about Jackson. He was elected in 1828. He's going to serve the will of common, ordinary Americans, Westerners. Think about his coalition, the, the Jackson Coalition. We're looking at frontier people, people in the South. People in the South here are desiring more land that they can expand to grow more cotton, more tobacco. Um, and so they're very supportive of this policy. And of course, Jackson, as we know in our debate, Jackson sees the policy as a very humane policy. He sees that once and for all, we can eliminate uh, an ongoing um, wars and violence between whites and Indians. Um, so he sees this as not only a, a he sees it as a win-win. This is a a win for the for for uh, American citizens, and this is a win for. The, uh, the the natives, but but ultimately uh, they are moved, um, and a group of uh, tribes, the the five civilized nations, the Cherokees, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminoles. These are the the five civilized. These are the, the these are the um, the five civilized tribes, the ones that have adopted in, in white ways in many in many respects, especially the Cherokee. Um, they resisted. 
Uh, a lot of these Indian groups did not resist, like the the Sauk and the uh, the Fox uh, did not resist Indian removal. Um, but but many of these, especially the Cherokee, did resist. They they pleaded with the Supreme Court. Uh, they took their 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 arguments to the U.S. government, uh, as we know already through the Marshall Court. But ultimately, they will be moved, and and this is what's called the Trail of Tears, the forced removal of Cherokees to Indian Territory, what we know today is Oklahoma. Of course, the, the Cherokee will settle here in the northwestern, um, or excuse me, the northeastern corner of what is now today um, uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, right across the border here from Fayetteville, Arkansas, is this is Cherokee country. So, um, And he was led for it. The American people loved it. This was a very popular policy. Um, Indian Affairs. Um, Jackson's attitude was the typically a, a Western. That what he thought about Indians. You got to understand his 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 point of view. He is a Westerner. He comes from Tennessee. He spent his career fighting Indians, and uh, um, he obviously felt like the Indians were better off if they were out of the way. And uh, during the election of 1828, Jackson fully in accord with the American people in the view that a just, humane, and liberal policy towards the Indians dictated moving them in the lands west of the Mississippi. And and so that's that's ultimately uh, how it played out. That's how it played out. So uh, one of the last controversies that occur uh, is over the bank. Um, the overriding national issue in the campaign of 1832 was not the Indian issue nor South Carolina's deception with the vacation. It was the question of rechartering the bank. The bank, uh, the bank is up for rechartering um, in uh, in in eighteen thirty eight, I believe eighteen thirty eight. Uh, the pro, or excuse me, in eighteen thirty six. It's up for rechartering in eighteen thirty six. The problem is. It's not 1836, it's 1832. And so what Henry Clay wanted to make the bank a political issue in Andrew Jackson's reelection. Okay? Now, Jackson in many ways was a lot like uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson when it came to the bank. He believed that the bank was the cause of the Panic of 1819. That the bank, the bank had grown uh, too powerful. It had grown too large. He he calls it a monster, a monster that needs to be slayed. You'll see a, a lot of uh, political cartoons uh, that were created at the time, in which uh, the opponents of the bank de uh, kind of depict the bank as this multi-headed monster. Um, he believed that it was unconstitutional. Uh, regardless of what John Marshall said in McCullough versus Maryland, uh, he, he believes, like Jefferson did, that the, uh, the the bank was unconstitutional. It was too large. It was too powerful. That the bank was run by individuals that uh, were corrupt and did not have the best interests of farmers and common men in mind. Uh, that it only benefited the wealthy. Uh, he preferred more of a hard money policy. Hard money is the use of, I mean, think about money that's hard. It's like gold and silver. Um, he, he preferred a, a hard money monetary system rather than a soft money. Okay, so we're talking about currency, paper money, uh, a soft money policy. And the bank supported a soft money policy. He And whatever it's worth, I mean, Jackson wasn't the, the intellect or the brainiac that Jefferson was. So he, he can't like quote you political or economic theory. He honestly felt in his bones that the bank was wrong. And he was blissfully aware that he was very ignorant on the whole subject. Um, but at the end of the day, man, he saw the bank as a monopoly controlled by the wealthy few. And, and this he saw is irreconcilable with democracy. Democracy does not, American democracy, anything that is power, uh, that has usurped a lot of power, it, that is incompatible with democracy. At the end of the 
Jay Jackson, of too much power being in the hands of the few. Now, the fact is, the reality is, the Bank of the United States was actually being run very well. It was being run by a guy by the name of Nicholas Biddle. Okay, he ran the Bank of the United States. The bank, over his under his management, had grown very powerful, very wealthy. It worked for the benefit of businesses. It supplied a stable currency. Uh, you know, and, and all really, and in many respects, the bank is doing its job. Uh, the reason why the United States economy is growing, the reason why the United States economy is prospering, is because of the success of the bank and Nicholas Biddle's operation of the bank. Now, Biddle, understanding that Jackson was a going to be a very vocal opponent of the bank, um, Biddle tried to win over Jackson by appointing a large number of Jackson's own people, Jackson's own supporters, to positions of power within the bank. But Jackson was not swayed. Um, despite the efforts of Biddle to win over Jackson, Jackson was not going to be won over. In, in Jackson's point of view, he was elected in 1828 with a mandate, and that mandate lay the monster to get rid of the bank and to destroy it. And so uh, Jackson, of course, was not swayed. Um, he preferred a, a government, a government-owned bank that was limited in power. And Jackson also supported the idea of state and local banks rather than having a large, powerful national bank. So um, Jackson said to Biddle in a letter in 1829, he said, quote, I think it right to be perfectly frank with you. I don't, I do not dislike your bank any more than all banks. But ever since I read the history of the South Sea bubble, I've been afraid of banks. The South Sea bubble was a big collapse in um, the, the banking sector in England. Um, and so he was, he was, yeah, so there you go. Uh, Jackson was perhaps right in his instinct that the bank lodged a great deal of power in a very few private hands, but Jackson was mistaken in his understanding of bank policies. And, and Biddle tried to uh, conciliate Jackson. He appointed a number of Jackson's men to branch office offices of the bank. However, in Jackson's first day of the Union, he questioned the bank's constitutionality and asserted that it failed to maintain a sound and uniform currency, which is not true. Uh, which is not true. Um, and what you have, what you got to understand, Biddle, he got on his knees and he begged Jackson. I mean, he worked Jackson over. He, please, 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 please do not destroy the bank. The bank is so important to the union, so important to the national economy. You are going to do harm than any good if you destroy, if you, if you destroy the, the bank in the United States. But here comes Mr. Clay. Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, wants to run for president in 1832. He believes that most people in the United States support the bank. And by making, uh, before the election, um, sending, rechartering the bank, he's, by sending the bank and its recharter to the president prior to the election, okay, uh, Clay was hoping that Jackson would veto the bank and therefore upset the voters and that would put henry clay into the white house okay so essentially clay tried to stack the deck against jackson by forcing jackson to veto the rechartering of the bank prior to the 1832 election and as it worked out that bill went to the to the to the president and he vetoed it here you can see jackson uh, as I told you, the monster, the, the, the metaphor, the bank as this multi-headed monster. Here you've got all the different heads of the bank, um, the different branch banks. You've got Mr. Biddle here in the middle. Uh, you've got uh, Martin Van Buren uh, holding the uh, couple of the heads <laughs> of, this, of, the, of the snake still, while Jackson is, is, is slaying the bank one head at a time. So that's um, 
So obviously it, it backfires on Clay. Uh, Clay instead loses the election of 1832. Uh, Jackson, as you see under this uh, electoral map, Jackson absolutely uh, annihilates uh, the Republican uh, Henry Clay. Clay, yes, wins his home state. He wins, uh, you know, some of the, the more um, uh, uh, elite states that were left. And But ultimately, um, uh, Jackson enters a second term um, victorious because of the bank, and, and Clay's plan backfires. So what he does now, um, and I think this is... Uh, this is Let's see, let me see here. All right, let's look here. No, hold on a second. There we go. No, there we go. All right. So what what Jackson does? I do not have a pen. I need a pen. Need a pen. Need a pen. I don't have a pen. This doesn't have a pen. Okay. No, nope. doesn't have a pen. Audience tools. No, nope. not it. Okay, no problem. All right. So what? Um, what Jackson does? He destroys the banks. He takes essentially all of the gold, all of the silver, all of the cash, all of the wealth out of the Bank of the United States. Okay. Uh, he takes all the wealth, all the gold, all the cash out of the Bank of the United States, and he puts it uh, into a group of pet banks, okay? Um, so if you imagine you've got, um, uh, you're taking all of the wealth of the country out of one bank, and you're redistributing that wealth amongst about a dozen pet banks, okay? Pet banks are like regional banks. Okay, and so the, the the wealth of the nation gets divided, uh, gets uh, splintered, gets split up amongst these pet banks. These pet banks then create branch banks called wildcat banks. These wildcat banks are tied to these pet these pet banks, and these wildcat banks are they're little branch banks that are kind of located out in the frontier. They're located out in rural America. Okay, and what was happening is that these wildcat banks um, were engaged in high speculation, high corruption. Land speculators went to these wildcat banks. They got loans. They borrowed money from these wildcat banks to go out west and to begin buying up western territory, buying land that was that was uh, cheap, and trying to resell that land at very high prices. And what that causes now, what that causes is it causes the economy to begin to spiral out of control. Um, speculation of frontier lands, okay? Remember, speculation is what helped cause, uh, helped to cause the, the panic of 1819. Um, usually, and I mentioned this in class, that anytime we have a panic or an economic downturn, that you're going to have um, it's going to be due to some level of speculation. In this case, it's speculation of frontier lands essentially causes the national economy to slow down. And we are going to enter another panic. This one's called the Panic of 18, 1837. Okay. Now, in order to stop the rampant speculation out west, okay, you got to know this. This is a no-card term. Uh, Andrew Jackson um, institutes a policy called specie circular. Specie circular was designed to halt the speculation of frontier lands by requiring frontier land to be sold, to be paid for with hard money. Hard money being gold and silver. Not a whole lot of people have gold and silver. So what that did, specie circular, it stopped, it slowed down the land speculation that was going on out west. Land speculation that was causing a lot of economic pain in the country. The United States, that the, the future success of the United States economically is the ability of Americans to be able to go out west and settle in those territories. And because of land speculation, 
the land was so expensive, Americans could no longer afford. Therefore, the economy stagnated. And so the individual who, who paid for it the most, okay, who paid for it the most, I'm going to go, let me go to, da, 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 da. It was Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren is elected in 1836, President of the United States. Of course, he is Andrew Jackson's handpicked successor. Uh, because Jackson destroys the bank, he does cause a lot of economic pain uh, in the country. All right. Uh, here you can see uh, Van Buren's um, uh, victory. Now, obviously, it looks a lot different from 1832. Um, you know, here the uh, Van Buren is, is trying to reverse a lot of the economic pain by creating an independent treasury, um, which was called through the divorce bill. I believe that's one of your note card terms. But uh, but it's too little, too late. And so the Panic of 1837 essentially kills the presidency of Martin Van Buren. Okay, it was caused by the bank, the uh, the the veto, of the National Bank, over speculation of lands in the West, the expansion of credit, uh, the loaning of all that money. Um, uh, to those speculators, and of course, a sharp decline in cotton prices. This this panic lasted for seven years, and, and it led to what was called the independent treasury movement. Independent treasury movement basically means the re the reestablishment of a national bank, and it also helped to enhance uh, the creation of a brand new political movement, a brand new political party. Okay. And so one of the topics you're going to need to be familiar with, um, it's very, very important, is the idea that Andrew Jackson um, is going to be accused of greatly enhancing, greatly um, uh, expanding the power of the executive branch. Um, in fact, his, his opponents are going to label him King Andrew the first, you know, they begin to see him as a king, you know, um, what evidence can you use um, to, to back up the opponent's claim of Jackson acting in a way of being a king? Uh, I think first uh, you look at the, uh, uh, the removal of the Indians, despite the fact that John Marshall, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, uh, ordered that he could not. Uh, Jackson did it anyway. Um, his excessive use of the veto, um, his excessive use of the veto um, was really one of the major reasons for it. Um, the, the, his kitchen cabinet, the fact that he uh, defied existing precedent um, in only having one cabinet, but the veto, the excessive use of the veto, according to Washington, George Washington, the veto should only be used if you feel like something is unconstitutional. Jackson uses the veto more than any president. All of his pres all of his predecessors combined, um, and he oftentimes used the veto not because he thought something was unconstitutional, but rather he was engaged in winning political feuds with people like Clay and Calhoun. And so, um, and of course, his his behavior and his actions during the whole nullification crisis really. His, his opponents really began to um, be very critical of Jackson and his efforts to expand the power of the executive branch. Here you can see in this very famous cartoon, this cartoon actually has been on multiple AP exams. Um, you can see him uh, with a ripped up constitution. He's trampling on the constitution. He's got the, uh, the staff, the regal staff and the the veto in his left hand, um, uh, donning the, the garb of a monarch. Now, back in England, back in England, the opponents of the king of England, they call themselves Whigs. They call themselves Whigs. And so the opponents of Andrew Jackson began to refer to themselves as Whigs. This is the birth of the Whig Party. The Republican Party becomes 
the Whig Party. And the Whigs, basically, the glue that held the Whig Party together was their hatred of Andrew Jackson. It was Southerners who hated Jackson because of the whole nullification crisis, and it was West and it was uh, Northerners who hated Jackson because of the bank veto. And so Jackson actually helps to create uh, a, a new opposition party, a new national party in opposition to his coalition, in opposition to his movement, and they're called the Whig Party. So now, uh, 1836 is the first election in which, um, or 1832, excuse me, 1832 is the first election in which you, you find um, uh, the opponents will label themselves Whigs instead of uh, Republicans. Okay, now, the age of Jackson, for what it's worth, the age of Jackson is a period of equality um, in which we see a lot of change. I mean, politically, a lot of the change going on in the country is this, what we call the new democracy, uh, which we've already talked about before, this, this concept of rotation of office, uh, the introduction of nominating conventions and selecting candidates, uh, uh, the easing of voting restrictions, restrictions that used to be there, um, those, the easing of those restrictions, and, and of course, what we call Jacksonian democracy. Uh, Jacksonian democracy. So I have a, a chart that is located um, on, my, on my Google page. Okay, um, there's a chart on my Google page. If you come down here, you will find it right there. Okay, um, you'll find it right there. But basically, it compares and contrasts uh, Jeffersonian and Jacksonian democracy. You're going to need to know this for the next test. Okay, uh, This right here, by the way, Jeffersonian versus Jacksonian democracy would be a tremendous prompt, essay prompt, a comparison essay comparing and contrasting Jeffersonian and Jacksonian democracy. Okay, So, of course, what does Jackson, the age of Jackson, look like economically? Jack, the age of Jackson, Jackson stood for the idea that economic progress is for all people. Uh, he expanded economic progress, not just for the, the wealthy and the rich, but he expanded uh, the chosen class to include the planters, farmers, laborers, and mechanics. Uh, he saw the bank as a monopoly for the rich, and he, and he sought to destroy that. Uh, corporate charters, he believed, should be available to all those who chose to risk starting a business. So he wanted to open up the, the entrepreneur, uh, the process of entrepreneurship, the idea of beginning a business, anybody being able to get into business, regardless of your class. Um, he believed that economic progress is for all Americans, not just for a handful. Um, he understood the need for industry. He thought industry was essential for the American economy. And so he did back up, despite the fact that he is a uh, born and raised in South Carolina, and even though he's a native Tennessean, he does support the protective tariff because he he does believe it's uh, um, it's vital for the national economy. Uh, he did believe in federal funding of internal improvements, especially if they're interstate projects, with the except with the exception of the Maysville Road veto. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, what the age of Jackson will also inspire is an equality movement. Now, this age of the common man means that not only should average, ordinary white males get the right to vote, but this now extends to all people, Native, Native American, women, blacks. So during the age of Jackson, we're going to have a lot of new reform movements. That'll be the subject of a... a uh, a, a future unit. Uh, in fact, it's going to be our next unit coming up um, and studying the reform movements of the age of Jackson that began during the age of Jackson. So you got to think of it in context at the time in which abolitionism and women's rights and this, this movement towards public education and all this, that as these reform movements were born, they're born during this age of Jackson where the common men uh, the, the, the ordinary average Americans are beginning to fight for equal treatment, okay? 
So uh, this idea of upward social mobility is a Jacksonian concept. Uh, the idea that that people are the economic and social ladder, the latter. You know, Jackson himself is a self-made man. Um, he believed that economic progress had accounted for his own upward social mobility. Follow his example. So, um, so how does the age of Jackson come to an end? Age of Jackson comes to an end in 1840 when we have the election of the first Whig, uh, the first Whig president of the United States in 1840, and that's William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison, uh, you should uh, his name should sound familiar to you. Uh, he was a general um, that that defeat. He's the guy who defeated Tecumseh in the Indian Wars prior to the War of 1812. Uh, he's the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe uh, in 1810 and becomes a major national war hero uh, due to this uh, this battle. And uh, he, like Jackson, uh, he's from the frontier. Uh, he's from Indiana. He was born in a log cabin. In fact, his campaign slogan in 1840 was hard cider and log cabins. And so what that, what that really means to us is that they believed that, the, the Whigs believed that uh, in order to win elective office, that um, you had to appeal to ordinary people, just like the Jackson, just like the the Jacksons, um, the Jacksons, just like the Jacksonians, the Democrats. That now you've got both national parties, the Whigs and the Democrats, vying for the support of ordinary Americans, uh, common Americans, and so you can see it in. Uh, in 1840, in 1840, the Whigs are going to nominate a guy just like Andrew Jackson, a guy who is a general, a guy who fights Indians, a guy who is from the West, a guy who was born in a log cabin, and who's a little bit of rough. He's a, he's, he's a little rough around the edges. Um, and so, uh, of course, his, uh, as you see here, his his other campaign slogan was "Tip a canoe and Tyler too." Tyler, of course, John Tyler is his running mate. His vice presidential running mate, Tippecanoe, is a reminder to the American voters that he is this war hero, um, dating back to the uh, the War of 1812, prior to the War of 1812. And so, um, that being said, that being said, in the election of 1840, of course, Van Buren is nominated again. Um, William Henry Harrison uh, becomes the candidate over Henry Clay and Webster. Um, now, the reason why Henry William Henry Harrison, like I said, the reason why he's picked to run for president over Webster and Clay is because he reminds, because he is most like Jackson. And that's the kind of guy the Americans want to vote for. And so uh, 1840 is a significant election. It is a, uh, uh, it's the, uh, it's known as the, the first mass turnout election in American history in which we see a huge surge in the number of people Voting, there are going to be tens of millions of new voters in this election uh, than voted that then that voted in the uh, the previous election. Uh, it's also the first election to feature campaigning to the masses, where you know you had these parades and you got these rallies, you know, where president a presidential candidate tours the the country and and actually asks the voters for their vote directly. Uh, expressly to the masses. Uh, the election of 1840 is also significant, and I, I didn't mention it here, but it's definitely worth noting, is that we have a very important third party, um, a third party uh, a, that, that is challenging the two major parties, and that third party is called the Liberty Party. And the Liberty Party nominated a guy by the name of James Burney, uh, uh, the Liberty Party, usually third party movements are one issue oriented. Um, and the big issue that the Liberty Party pushed was anti-slavery. So this is the first anti-slavery party in American history. So now you know slavery is becoming increasingly a, a, a major uh, divisive issue, a major political issue in the country. Of course, William Henry Harrison, um, 
catches a cold, gets his pneumonia uh, during his inaugural. Uh, he actually set the record for having delivered the, lar the longest inaugural address in presidential history. It was inaugural address was over three hours long. Uh, he gave his inaugural address in the freezing cold without a an overcoat and a top hat. And he, and he dies 31 days into his presidency. John Tyler becomes the new president. Of course, this is the first time we see a transfer of power from vice president to the president. I had that backwards there. So, and so that ends the, the age of Jackson. It ends the age of Jackson. So uh, with that being said, um, this is the end of our time together. Uh, I want to, okay, there we go. Hey, this is uh, the end of our time together. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you please uh, just uh, forward them to me and uh, I will, I will, I will be in in the morning. If you, again, the expectation is you guys need to uh, um, provide your notes for me. Um, your job is to, to, to watch this and, and take notes off of it and I will do a notes check. So, um, I hope this was uh, a benefit to you. If you have any questions, make sure you come see me in the morning. And uh, I wish you a great evening.